Don't get it twisted. History is not truth. It is not fixed. History evolves because it has to evolve, because history is described and made by people. Therefore, one of the easiest ways to understand a civilization is not so much how do they talk about the present, but how do they frame the past. I'm not a history professor, I'm a French teacher, but in that role at a university I often have to teach history, and what I've learned is that the best thing you can do, or the most important thing you can do, is help students to destroy popular and comforting myths. And that is what, on an artistic level, More Mother has done with her album The Great Bailout, the deluxe edition I'm going to be reviewing right now. Thank you for auditing the Always Positive New Music Review Show, hosted by a French professor who's had to deal with a lot of these popular and comforting myths being destroyed. If you're an American and I tell you, hey, the Civil War uh, happened not just because uh, we wanted to end slavery, that might make you uncomfortable. When I teach French history, I often talk about Versailles. How do you not talk about Versailles? What a beautiful palace. What an amazing example of state power. I tell my students the same thing every time. I say, whenever you go to Versailles, and I hope you go, it's a beautiful place, I want you to have one image in your head. I want you to picture the entire building covered, ceiling to floor, drowning in blood. I want you to feel blood dripping under the gardens, the, tended by Le Nôtre. I want you to see it in the Galerie des Glaces. I want you to look at Versailles and not see stone. I want you to see blood because it was built off of the slave trade. That is a very easy popular myth to destroy about the grandeur of France. If you don't talk about the grandeur of France without talking about its, its slave trade, then you actually miss the truth behind history. As a personal story, I grew up in Massachusetts, and as a matter of fact, my family goes back a long way. In my family, there's a place called the Jackson Homestead. It's in Newton, Massachusetts. It's beautiful. Uh, we gave it to the, my, my father gave it to the town of Newton, and it's now a place you can go and see how people used to live a long time ago. Now, when I grew up, I was told that that was a stop on the Underground Railroad, and that gave me a sense of pride, you know? That meant that I was one of the good ones, or my family was one of the good ones. And then I went there a couple years ago, and I was looking around, and I was looking at all the lessons, and they said, uh, it's debated whether or not this was a stop on the Underground Railroad. And I was like, oh, well, that's not great. And then the next, next room said, and actually, there were domestic slaves here at the Jackson Homestead. <laughs> so I went in the span of one day from a descendant of a freedom fighter to somebody who owned slaves in Massachusetts, not even you know, considered to be a slave state. This is why so-called woke education is so important, why DEI education is so important. That's why the fight against it is so nefarious. Because happy stories, happy perspectives, if they are not based on reality, they can really influence the way you see the present. The war on education, I think, is a war on behalf of comforting myths. And who is comforted by comforting myths? It's always people in power. They are the people who are comforted. So it is a political act, a very specific political act, to allow ourselves off the hook historically. Which is what makes this great bailout by Moore Mother so interesting and so fascinating. You know, she's from Philadelphia, and she's writing all about, about England. Uh, the comforting myth that, that she is trying to destroy in this historical, jazzy, spoken word... I, piece of art, just, just called a piece of art. Do we need genres? Do we even need mediums at this point? It's to destroy a very nice myth that has existed in England for a very long time. The abolition of slavery in Great Britain was because the British were virtuous, unlike those slimy French, unlike so many other, unlike the Americans, they abolished the slave trade in 1808. Golf claps all around, okay? That's great. Their abolitionists actually work. Now, slavery itself wasn't abandoned, wasn't uh, forbidden until 1833. That was when it was passed. It was actually instituted in 1834. And we have all these great figures of history, in particular a guy named Wilberforce, who have been for, you know, a century and a half, if not more, treated as like these saints who understood, like Montesquieu understood, that slavery is wrong and we have to do something. The problem is 
That's a myth. That is a comforting myth. Much like the myth of France being a, a nation of resistors was broken by The Sorrow and the Pity, the great movie uh, by Ophuls in 1970. The myth of the British abolitionists was broken in 1944. So that's how I'm going to be framing this whole review. I, done, I did some research. Listen, I'd, I've done a lot of work on C.L.R. James, who's a great historian from Trinidad, who wrote about Haiti. And his book, The Black Jacobins, is a book I recommend at least once a year, if not more. He had a colleague and future enemy. It's a very complicated story. Another uh, Trinidadian, 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 I think it's Trinidadian, uh, intellectual named Eric Williams. And this is his book, Capitalism and Slavery. Okay? This is the book published in 1944 that destroyed that myth. And this is the work upon which this album is based on. So that's the primary text that I've gone to. You also see, where is it? You also see back here, uh, they recently uh, published his thesis that was the basis of this work. So this was made in 1938, the economic aspect of the abolition of the West Indian slave trade and slavery. I'll put that right, I'll put that, I have too many books, y'all. I'll put that right here, all right? God damn it. I don't edit my videos, so you're just gonna get to see my frustration in real time. Here we go, everybody. Eric Williams, stay there, please. All right. So that's the primary text. I'll also include, in the event that you don't have time and space to go find these books and read them, that's okay. There are some good YouTube sites I will send you to. A pretty good lecture by a guy named James Hartfeld called The Slavery Debate, Why C.L.R. James and Eric Williams Were Right, in that he does a very good explanation of his basic argument, what some people call uh, the Williams thesis. Slavery was not abolished because it was the morally right thing to do. That's not why. It was the economically right thing to do. That's not to say there were not abolitionists. That's not to say there did not exist people who believed that slavery was wrong. But the reason that it actually, factually was abolished was because it was in the economic best interests of England. And Williams goes through the whole thing, all the different reasons. The loss of the colonies, meaning America made it less profitable. India was so much more profitable in terms of exports and indentured servants. All, and this whole crazy system where essentially, where slavery was so profitable in the 18th century, in the 19th century, it just became not profitable. It ended up being that most of the people who were running these plantations were in great, great, great debt. It was called one of the most expensive thing, that slave labor is like the most expensive labor you could have. That's in some quote somewhere. I think it was from maybe Smith. A big, big dude, Clarkson, I think. Clarkson's the guy who said that. And so that's the truth. And listen, uh, he says one thing that I really appreciate. He, he's, he's a white guy, another white academic. He talks about not believing in white guilt. And I'm often accused of, of expressing white guilt. And I, I'm with him. I don't feel white guilt. It's not a question of guilt. Because as Freud points out, guilt is a narcissistic emotion. It's about how do I feel. It gives me the power to feel bad, okay? I don't feel guilty. I just am observing history. Okay, so my great, great, great grandfather, grandmother, whatever, in the Jackson homestead owning slaves, that doesn't make me guilty. But me not being able to sit with that fact means that I am willfully ignorant. Okay, moving on. So, what happened? What actually happened in this moment where they realized that slavery was no longer profitable, they used it to their advantage. So, <laughs> what did they do? England, thanks to the Napoleonic Wars, had a huge navy. He, of course, that's what they're famous for. They've got boats. That's what Napoleon said in the movie. They've got boats. But how do you justify having all those boats? Oh, we'll be the anti-slave brigade. So this gave them the moral justification to stop and seize any boat that they saw in the whole goddamn ocean to make sure that there were no slaves there. So they were marauding in the sake of justice and truth and the British way, but in reality, they were justifying their military budget while also exerting their naval power. 
Does this sound familiar to you of how any 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 country that has power and the history of civilization behaves, how it needs to justify its military force by seemingly benevolent actions, turn after turn after turn after turn? This even led, and again, unbelievable consequences, that they decided they needed to really make sure there was no slavery in Africa, so they all got together, all the European powers got together with a gigantic map of Africa and carved it up so that, okay, oh yeah, well, we'll control the resources and we'll still have colonies, but we'll make sure there's no slavery. We can exploit and take, but we cannot enslave, all right? These, these are, listen, this is just history. It's not good or bad, it's just history. It's a bad history, but it's just history. And on top of all that, the bizarreness of what happened is they had, they had to pay reparations, you know? Because listen, slavery, it's a terrible, terrible thing. And when you stop slavery, it's a terrible thing for the people who own the slaves, because you gotta pay them back. They lost property. That's why the album's called The Great Bailout, because 20 million pounds was paid to the plantation owners. Now, if you actually go into it, it's insane <laughs> because the plantation owners were actually $20 million in debt because it's so expensive. It was such a bad business deal to be a plantation owner at that time. So the money was, this kind of horse hockey exists today, right? The money was given to the plantation owners who then turned around and gave it to the banks. So essentially, it was just like a financial circle jerk where who got rich, the bankers, the, even the plantation owners, like they were made whole, but they basically just got out of their debt. And who's left with nothing? Of course, the people who were shipped over to the, to, to the West Indies, to the Caribbean, for absolutely no reason at this point. It's great because when you study these things, you really get to deeper truths. You know, Barclays Bank, the famous Barclays Bank, the Premier League by Barclays, right? Well, they were founded by Quakers, and most of the, or many of the abolitionists in America and in, and in England were Quakers, you know, an interesting uh, religious sect. And so, you know, they didn't, they didn't believe in slavery, but they were a bank, and they made a lot of money off of slavery, and one could argue that the entire and this is an argument that Williams makes, that the entire Industrial Revolution could not have happened without slave labor, that the banking explosion could not happen without slave labor. As more Mother suggests, perhaps when we look at Big Ben, maybe we see that, and we see that blood dripping down too. Maybe we don't just limit it to Versailles. I'll include a link to another really, it's a little bit deeper, it's sort of like second level, it's 201. Uh, it's like a meeting of William scholars. I'll include a link to that as well. Uh, it's quite interesting. Uh, in particular, we're going to be focusing on the city of Liverpool, but I'll get to there in a second. All right. And I just, I'm thankful. I'm thankful because I missed this album. Listen, I'm, I'm in my office, by the way, so my hair, it's, there's not much air conditioning in my office, so my hair is going to keep drooping and I'm going to keep seeing it and it's going to keep bugging me. So we're just going to have to be here together. And that book is totally falling down again. But I'm thankful for this deluxe edition. You know, I reviewed her jazz codes a couple years ago. And the thing is, she is a talented enough of an artist and a deep enough of an intellectual that her work scares me because I want to do it justice. I, I think... Um, of all, you know, I, I don't watch everything that Anthony Fantano does, uh, but sometimes I do. I watch this review of this. And I think this is some of his best work because he managed to talk about this album in a way that got to the deeper truths while also praising its strengths in seven minutes. <laughs> I can't do that. So anyways, uh, but I'm happy that we have a deluxe edition because that means it's new. That gives me a chance. I just missed this album. I'm happy here. So what does she say? Here's what she says on her website about this. The Great Bailout is an expansive meditation that acts as a non-linear world map about colonialism, slavery, and commerce in Great Britain. Come, come look, come see, come here, come see London, come see Liverpool for the first time even if for the millionth. Know its providence, know its haunting. Clear the mist over your eyes and heart as the famous London fog has been cleared by the clarion call of Moor Mother. For this is what the great bailout is, a call to knowing through a sonic scene that is unafraid to look a violent legacy in the eye. And that is what we have to do. That is the first step that we have to do. We have to deal with history truthfully. 
we have to accept that this comforting myth is not true. Now, I'm going to give you an example song, but it's actually not a song, it's a video. Um, so, you know, my dad died a couple years ago, and I'm bummed, you know, because I was in the New York Times yesterday, and I'm sure he would love to have seen that. Um, but also because, like, I'm, I know there's certain videos he would have really related to. So I think he would have really, really connected with this, and in particular, the video for all the money. I'll include a link to it up there, if I remember, which I almost never do. Okay? Now, musically, it's... I'm going to say this a couple times during this video. Do not underestimate more mother's music. Her speaking is so good. Her thematics are so strong. She gets you going on a sort of intellectual whip de doo kind of world that you just might sleep on. How amazing, well-made, subtle, this tinkling industrial sounds, this tinkling piano and just ghosts. Like this album is like... <laughs> if Luigi's Mansion was a slave ship, it's like... Uh, it's like a totally awesome, haunted album. Everywhere, everywhere, there's just ghosts and creaking sounds. And the sounds are the sounds of chains, and they're the sounds of boats creaking and wood. And this has this great, it develops with just more and more ghostly layers and these kind of far away lethargic drums. And this singer, Alia Al Sultani, apparently an Iraqi British singer, singing just sort of, oh, and we have in the song all these dates. And when you watch the video, which I really, hey, just watch the video, would you? these lyrics. Who paid it back? Who burned it? How long did it burn? Who had to breathe in the smoke? Who had to chase the smoke away? Who was the alarm? Who is still burning? Was it before or after the Palace of St. Westminster? History lesson. St. Margaret's Church, a place of worship, sits 1614 in the House of Common Evils. Where did they get all the money? Where did they get all the money? That's the question they keep asking. Where did they get all the money? That's where did they get all the money? Where did they get all the money? Where did anyone get all the money? How did they get all the money? How did they get all the money? Do I have to ask you one more time? Diamond Jubilee. Where did they get all the money? 1753 British Museum. Eight million items. Eight million objects. They heard about the kingdoms of gold. Black Panther, the movie, deserves a lot more credit than it gets because of the Killmonger character going to the British Museum. That is like one of the greatest scenes in movie history. That is one of the greatest scenes in movie history because it, it dramatizes something that post-colonial thinkers have fantasized about and have talked about for a century now. How do we get our stuff back? How, how does London, how does England, how does France, how do they still get the, still get the tourism money to go look at, at African artifacts? They heard about the books of mathematics, the philosophy, the ritual. They heard about the ritual. They heard about the dances. They heard about the drums. They heard about the rhythms. Let's remember, as I like to say, if you've ever liked any music with a drum in it, thank somebody of African descent, okay? <laughs> like so much of our popular culture, so much of our art culture. So whatever American culture is or American influence culture is, invariably its source is 99.9% .9 of the time black so it's fascinating because this album is it's not really about england it's about england but it's not about england it's intentionally a tapestry it's intentionally a complicated work that talks about america and talks about england at the same time i think it's talking about england to create a false sense of security for its mostly american listener base and then just throwing in little reminders here they fashion themselves like the romans before themselves the thieves disguised as emperors the storms keep raging falling down falling down empires keep falling down the storm keeps raging where do they get all the money London Bridge falls down, all these things. And when you watch this video, it's fascinating because it's just, it's, it's like, it starts off with these portraits of great leaders of Europe and then smoke because there's smoke and there's fire all the way through here. And they show the cathedral that's mentioned in the song. And then these, it, these pictures are handled with museum gloves, you know, the rubber gloves that you use in, in a museum. You know, my, my, my grandfather used to work in museums, you know, I just sort of, you know, pictures of the crown jewels and cut out nicely. Hey, where'd the crown jewels come from? Where'd they get all that money? Where'd they get all that money? <laughs> Some brutal imagery of the slave trade in here and then mixed in with the Tower Bridge, more slave work in the West Indies, engraving of slave purchases, and then like an American map 
a map of slavery in America, and then some American politicians and an image of uh, lynching in, in Tyler, Texas, and then an image of Josh Hawley going like this to the insurrectionists. Political. Hey, why did, why did more mother have to get political? This was just a good historical album. I don't like it when people point out that iniquitous racists are running around the corridors of power with impunity. I don't like it. I'm being facetious here. And then just like, who helped build this country is the question. And that's the question. That's a great question. Who helped build this country? What country is she saying? She's saying England, she's saying America. A picture of the Muriel, Mariel boat lift from Cuba, images of the Haitian boat people, a question of migrants, you know, that's where we are right now. That's one of the great ethical and moral questions that we have right now. How do we treat people? people like human beings who come to England, who come to America, who need asylum and need help, primarily through historical iniquities committed by England and by America. Jesus Christ. It's just not that. That's the problem. That's, that's, that's the problem. Is, is, and I, I say this whenever I can. Anytime someone tries to come at you with some kind of anti-DEI, anti-affirmative action, uh, anti-housing equality, uh, whenever I'm trying to come with that stuff, just ask them the question, hey, cool, when does history start? When does it start? If history starts in 1964, if history starts in 1865, if history starts in 2008, then okay, I get what you're saying, I guess. I guess there could be some bootstraps going on here, but when does history start? Because you can't just start history. You can't just start history at the time that makes the most sense for your argument. You have to start history when history starts. And then like more famous people, more British buildings, then an image of an earth mover, a reminder that this kind of exploitation is still going on. Africa is still being exploited. The Caribbean is still being exploited. Now it's also being exploited by China, not just by Europe and by America. Okay, got more exploiters here. It cuts between that and sugarcane, very intentional imagery between slave, uh, you know, enslaved people and kings, an image of a stock trading floor, and then images of, of a slave trader selling the slaves, and then blood all over the images and all of these slave ship images, and then they kind of match up with like the, the Arabic thought that was stolen that ties into this idea of like not only do people go to Africa to steal people, but to steal ideas. And then there's an image of Marsha Blackburn. Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Do you know who Marsha Blackburn is? She's a Republican out of Tennessee. Uh, she also, and this is a, a quote I found from an article, she lectured uh, the first black woman nominated to the Supreme Court about white privilege. Because again, she thinks white privilege doesn't exist. Because when does history start, Marsha Blackburn? So she's there, I, she made it political. All right, all those things all wrap up. So we're talking about England, we're talking about America, we're talking about 1830s, we're talking about right now, we're talking about the 17, we're talking about the 16, because that's the problem. You know, when does history start? But then the other question is, when does history stop? When do we stop feeling the result of all those things? Do people in Jamaica, do people in America, are people who are descendants of people who were enslaved, are they how free are they of the consequences of that enslavement? What, what, what is our duty in that case? Okay, I'm going to go through the rest of the album a little bit quicker here. Just as a reminder, I do not represent my university. I represent myself. I'm in my office, but I just represent myself. So, in the event there's any Marshall Blackburn stands out there, uh, you know, uh, maybe she has some good policies on other stuff. I don't know. Album starts with a track called Guilty. Um, more tinkling sounds, synth strings, you know, the, the sort of enigmatic singer Lonnie Holly's in the back, and for years and years watched the slave ships unload. Beautiful singing, just, just Lonnie Holly is just like this great haunting voice everywhere, and this whole question of being guilty and the payments of amnesia and pay off the trauma and pay off the trauma. Interestingly, I, I don't think this is about reparations. Uh, that's one of the things, one of the videos I sent you to is uh, arguing against reparations, which I'm not going to take a stand one side or the other, but there is a very interesting argument often made by people who are descendants of slaves 
uh, uh, of the enslaved saying that they are against uh, reparations. So check out that argument there, uh, because part of the idea, I think that's this, is pay off the trauma. You know, can we pay off the trauma? You know, if we gave 40 acres and a mule uh, to every descendant of an enslaved person in America, uh, would we be off the hook? Would we be okay? Would we be able to say it's fine? Uh, she ends the song by saying the horror, the horror over and over again, and it's very horrific, but it's also heavenly with these harps digitalization to globalization we still hardly got none again when does history stop and when does history start god save the queen it's the next song this is sort of so like the last album is like this huge lesson on jazz and i had a hard time with it because i have a hard time with jazz music it's, just, it's not that i don't like it i just i always feel like i am so ignorant i shouldn't even open my mouth at all <laughs> about jazz music but as always whenever you're ignorant just say you're ignorant and then it's okay you know and then you can just work from there I should be clear. I was ignorant on the aboli uh, abolition question in England. Uh, this album forced me to learn about it. This album forced me, you know, to read capitalism and slavery because I, I, I wasn't aware. I, I was not aware because I, <laughs> I studied the history of French slavery. You know, ad hoc, ad lock, and quid pro quo. So little time, so much to know. So God save the Queen. You know, this is one of these great expressions. Uh, that's used all the time, and it's now God save the king and let freedom ring, have her plantations been saved, and just this idea of the British love of the queen and what does it mean. Obviously, the queen just died recently, and there's a whole debate about whether or not people should feel bad, and, and people were shaming people for not feeling bad for their wonderful, wonderful, wonderful queen, and it really is a question of whose life has meaning. Um, I really suggest you watch my video about the Stromae song, um, about the prostitute who died and got a state funeral. I think it's really good. And also just weirdly, temp you know, <laughs> I don't think more mother could have known that former President uh, Donald Trump was almost assassinated, uh, but he was. It happened a week ago. Maybe you didn't notice it. Um, a lot's happened since then. So, uh, so yeah, so someone shot at, at, uh, at former President Donald Trump and hit him in the ear, and the, the discourse at the Republican National Convention was that he was chosen by God. You know, God... God turned his head to look at a graph filled with false information designed to dehumanize people who are fugitives and migrants. And by uh, supporting that false graph, we are actively supporting the death of many people whose governments are largely destabilized by our own war on drugs. But anyways, I'm not going to get political. I don't like it when I get political. But, you know, a like different dude died, <laughs> okay? So like, there's a dude, some firefighter. I don't know who he is. I don't know. I've heard bad things about him, too. But uh, I, I don't believe in the death penalty. So um, so what's up? So God God wanted to save Trump, but wanted to kill that other dude, that firefighter with with, the, with, with kids? That's how God works? God, God save the king, huh? God save the queen. Have her plantations been saved? Then we get to the stamp, all the money, which I discussed, then compensated emancipation. I did the math. According to, to, to Williams here, um, one twentieth of the GDP of England was given to the former uh, plantation owners. Uh, that's $20 million pounds. If that were done now, it would be, according to the current GDP of England, $1.6 trillion, that would be 80 billion pounds. That's billion with a Sagan, okay? <laughs> That's how much money in, in today's money would, would be given for people who are being paid off, who are being bailed out because they owned other human beings. Compensated emancipation, that's what it was. Why am I here? She keeps saying that over and over again. These growling synths, gospel-like wails, references anti, uh, Andrew Jackson and anti-blackness has colonized the domains of truth. And that's, that's, the, that's the question. At any moment, they'll be coming around to deliver another blow. Democrats, Republicans, Tories, choking, choking, choking. This whole idea, and I think this is an important one, is, you know, that the, the white liberal, myself included, is not, is not, uh, is not necessarily... Um, on the right side here, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, Republicans are, uh, and Tories are demonstrably worse. 
uh, for you know people of color and then than uh, than Democrats and, and liberals and so on. But in the end, it's still going to come down to money. In the end, it's going to be self-interest. In the end, that 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 marginal difference is not as great as I would like it to be. It's a comforting myth that we tell ourselves as white leftists and white liberals uh, that we are the good ones. Death by longitude, more sounds of bells and tinkling. What do we say in Jamaica? Europe is God, everything else is the devil. This goes into you know, some of the basic ideas of, of how white supremacy has been taught throughout the centuries. Uh, directly references different places like Aberdeen. Beautiful city in Scotland, by the way. You ever been to Aberdeen? The whole place is granite. It's beautiful. Uh, but yeah, most of its money came from the slave trade. London, Bristol, we'll talk more about places like that. All aboard, death camps, death ships, uh, the image of the image of the transatlantic slave trade as a death camp is quite useful. Uh, 65 billion pounds on your head. I think that's supposed to represent both the load that is carried and also the money that is created. There's even some whip, whipping sounds. Reminder, 46,000 British... Uh, uh, shareholders fell out, so those are the people who had to be bailed out. I think this might also be a little bit about the banks, you know, like whenever there's a gigantic uh, crisis in in the financial system, uh, the people who get hurt are not the ones who are helped. It's the people who hurt who get bailed out. Like that's what happened in 2008 with the great bailout and the big short and Christian Bale, uh, you know, uh, looking cool. Like that's w what happens. People get hurt are never the ones who are bailed out. My soul has been anchored. It's just like a far away medieval string instruments mixed in with like some gospel recording and the sounds maybe of rattling chains. I'm telling you, this album feels like a soundtrack to a very scary movie. And then we get to Liverpool wins. Okay, which means I get to bring this up, okay? So I teach French history and literature. Now this actually belonged to my grandparents. Okay, this is Vous de la Porte uh, et Place Bourgogne sur la Porte de la Ville de Bordeaux. So this is a picture of Bordeaux. Isn't it beautiful? It's from the 1730s, 40s, 50s. I don't know when this print was made. Somewhere around there. It's a nice old print. And it's a beautiful image. And you're never going to guess what this image should actually look like. I should cover it in blood. This whole place... Bordeaux's a beautiful, you know, the, the, the Bordeaux soccer team, the Girondins, uh, they just filed for bankruptcy. And they're like one of the great teams in the history of French soccer. It's really sad. Like Zidane played for them and everything after Khan. And it's really sad that this, this team is going because Bordeaux represents such great, like, the history of France. Like, as a matter of fact, the name for the Bordeaux football team, the soccer team, is the Girondins which is the part of, of France that they're in, La Gironde, but also like during the French Revolution, you know, during the French Revolution, a lot of the most revolutionary revolutionaries were from Bordeaux, who were fighting so hard for freedom, you know, who were fighting so hard for the rights of human beings against the tyranny and the slavery of the monarchy. What gave those people that power? What gave the bourgeoisie the power to fight for their freedom? Capital. Capital gave them that power. Where did they get the capital? From the slave trade. Okay? You can't make this stuff up. This is just what history is. This, that is just simply what history is. That's just the truth. Without the slave trade... The, 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 the middle class would never have been powerful enough and rich enough to challenge the aristocracy. So, isn't it great? <laughs> you know? It makes sense. You know? It makes sense that the, 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 the greatest, the person who said, give me liberty or give me death, owned slaves. Thomas Jefferson owned slaves. George Washington owned slaves. And the reason that's important is because this concept of freedom is so malleable. And so often it ends up being tied in. Okay, let's get even deeper, okay? Now listen, I'm not a Marxist. I'm a capitalist, okay? I, I know. I'm talking like uh, I'm not based, okay? That doesn't mean I don't read Marx, okay? If you don't read Marx, you're not a good historian. 
just sorry, you know? So what's interesting is he talks about Liverpool. So I talked to you about Bordeaux because Bordeaux is a lot like Liverpool in France. I mean, it's like the, the French Liverpool. So Liverpool, you know, you think of it as being like, you know, Mo Salah. <laughs> you know, you think about the football team or you think about the Beatles. You know, Liverpool can be the only place on a Saturday night. It's only Thursday morning. You know, you might be thinking about that. But Liverpool is actually so much like the center of the slave trade in England. that That's how Marx refers to it in Capital. OK, volume one of Capital. Big old heavy book here. All right. Both C.L.R. James and Williams were heavily influenced by Karl Marx. OK, so I'm going to read to you what Karl Marx says about Liverpool. So you understand why are we singing about Liverpool? Why is why is more mother singing about it? England thereby uh, acquired the right to supply Spanish America until 1743 to uh, with 4,800 Negroes a year. At the same time, this threw an official cloak over British smuggling. Liverpool grew fat on the basis of the slave trade. This was its method of, pri of primitive accumulation. That's what this section is called, so-called primitive accumulation. Right there. And even to the present day, Liverpool quality have remained the pindars of the slave trade, which, as noted by the work of Dr. Aiken we have just quoted, has coincided with a spirit of bold adventure which has characterized the trade of Liverpool and rapidly carried it to its present state of prosperity, has occasioned vast employment for shipping and sailors, and greatly augmented the demand for the manufacturers of the country. In 1730, Liverpool employed 15 ships in the slave trade. In 1751-53, in 1760-74, in 1770-96, and in 1792, 132. While the cotton industry introduced child slavery into England, in the United States, it gave the impulse for transformation of the earlier, more or less patriarchal slavery into a system of commercial exploitation. In fact, the veiled slavery of the wage laborers in Europe needed the unqualified slavery of the New World as its pedestal. Okay, so they're building a lot on here. The concept that the Industrial Revolution was built on slavery uh, is, 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 not, is not at odds here, okay? This is like, okay. Tantae moles erat. To unleash the eternal natural laws of the capitalist mode of production, to complete the process of separation between the workers and the conditions of their labor, to transform at one pole the social means of production and substance into capital, and at the opposite pole the mass of the population into wage laborers, into the free laboring poor, that artificial product of modern history. If money, according to Ogier, comes into the world with a congenital blood stain on one cheek, capital comes dripping from head to toe from every pore with blood and dirt. That's him talking about Liverpool. What about Williams talking about Liverpool? You'll never look at the Beatles the same. What the West Indian trade did for Bristol, the slave trade did... Uh, for Liverpool. In 1565, Liverpool had 138 households, householders. Seven streets only were inhabited. The port's merchant marine amounted to 12 ships and 223 tons. Until the end of the 17th century, the only local event of importance was the siege of the town during the English Civil War. Okay? And he goes on and on and talking about how Liverpool has been it is a common saying that the principal streets of Liverpool had been marked out by the chains and the walls of the houses cemented by the blood of African slaves. All right, this is 1944 that he's writing this. And then he talks about how actually that started to decrease. The profitability started to go away. The, 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 they had built up through slavery, but then they ended up making more money in other areas, which made abolition possible. So... That's why we're talking about Liverpool. She loves you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Real nowhere, man. But that's the truth of Liverpool. When you see it, you should see it drowned head to toe in blood. Quotes a bunch of dates here. Talks about, you know, when, when the sla slavery was abolished and then when it was actually put in there. Talking about the bailout. Don't stop. Won't stop. And then has this whole beautiful section on the National Portrait Gallery. Okay, so in 1856, 
they open up the first National Portrait Gallery. According to Moore Mother, she says, Europeans first encounter with a mirror and look at how they see themselves. In the famous painting of Queen Victoria, she is presenting a Bible to a Moor in Windsor called The Secret of England's Greatness. Now, if you haven't seen what that portrait looks like, here's what it is. And this is how England sees itself. It's actually a Moorish king. It's not just some random Moor, okay? That's an African king right there. And he's bending the knee and he's receiving a, oh, a Bible, thanks, okay? Receiving a Bible from the queen. That is the way that Europe sees itself. The National Portrait Gallery is a mirror. That's the way that she is phrasing it. It's interesting because it also reminds me of Billy Woods' Ethiop, his album Ethiop, which has the, the Rembrandt cover with the, the, the head of two Ethiopians, I believe is what it was called. And that's in a gallery, and famously that gallery is named after its benefactor. And its benefactor, wait, how did he make all this money? Was it from tulips? Hmm. Oh, no. It was through the slave trade. Okay. Where did they get all the money? Where did they get all the money? Where did they get all the money? It's, it's not woke to ask the question, where the hell did the money come from? You can ask that of anybody. Where did the Kennedys get their money? Look that up, okay? Where did the Clintons get all their money? All right? I'm not saying there's, there's good people. Anyways. And it even settles into a little groove, a little stilted beat. I'm not talking as much about the music, but do not underestimate it. It's just the whole the whole thing is so beautiful. It's so well made that you don't focus on that. South Sea featuring Sistas of the Nitty Gritty. Another more moaning spiritual song. The sound, again, of sort of chains. Where and when do ancestors speak for themselves? If the, master, if the master's clock stops, does time stop? Lies about time, the question of time. And I think this is sort of tied into the, the concept that, hey, what time is it? Did you know that there is a correct time? It's true. There, there is a time zone that is the official time zone. It's in England. A town called Greenwich. Why isn't it in New York? Why isn't it in Shanghai? Because when they determined what, what time was, when we all agreed what time was, the dominant power was England. The dominant scientific power, the dominant naval power, the dominant military power, the dominant financial power. Therefore, time. Like time. Like, like literally a completely fabricated human attempt to define something that does not exist. Okay? I could tell you that this video has lasted exactly two-thirds of a scribble dibble, and that is just as accurate as saying it has been 43 minutes and 12 seconds. But somehow, Greenwich Mean Time, Greenwich Correct Time exists. This kind of normative, colonialist horse hockey is interesting. Every single time you see Greenwich Mean Time, you are existing in a, in a colonial space. And she mentions Ethiopian. And again, kind of tying together. I think this album pairs super nicely with uh, Ethiop's by, uh, by Billy Woods, by the way. The album ends before the deluxe edition with Spem in Album. Uh, and this is a very short song, and it's a reference to a, I believe, 1560 uh, song by someone named Thomas Tallis. And it's some very famous medieval British music. I don't know why this is there. Maybe this is like music from before the slave trade, sort of like what England was before this started. I don't know. Now, I want to speak briefly, briefly about the bonus tracks, because the bonus tracks are like your reward. They're like the coolest remixes, <laughs> because this is just basically just to remind you, do not underestimate her musicianship. God Save the Queen, more ominous, her voice is more present. Now it's like, it, where before it was kind of like, uh, it was sort of this sort of jazzy thing. Now it's like this semi-militaristic, with like a, like a military snare. It's just a total remix. And like the lyrics, this whole remix bit like takes little bits from here and there, because this is the thing. This is the thing about like, about avant-garde and modern, and like any kind of anti-colonial art, invariably anti-colonial art, excuse a lot of the parameters and 
definitions, the delineations that we think are necessary, you know, like linearity, uh, cohesion, those kinds, like fighting against that is in and of itself a fight against these kinds of systems of power like colonial power. So I think it makes sense that the lyrics on this album can be and are remixed at the same time as the music is remixed because it's basically one idea. The album is basically one idea. Like, hey, we'll, we'll talk about what the idea is at the end. Because I got good news for you. Ah, damn it, I meant to start off the whole thing saying I was going to end the video with good news. It's not all a big bummer. My soul's been anchored, movement two. Now it's an opera. It's beautiful. It's just beautiful. The singing. Like what was a gospel song is now opera and a reminder. I don't need to tell you what you should probably see when you go to a beautiful opera house in, in Europe. You should probably see it dripping with blood. I'm sorry. And I'm saying that about Europe, but that's true for America too, okay? Even though most of my family is from the Northeast, it doesn't mean. Anyways, there's blood dripping everywhere. Jesus. Um, it's interesting because it makes this whole idea of like whiteness bridging intercontinental, and it's fascinating, right? Because you know races don't exist. I, I think it's I think it's in this book where he talks about you know that <laughs> racism didn't create slavery. Slavery created racism. Right? And that's true. Like, if you study Haitian history especially, that's very true. Um, like, like once slavery existed, because before there were African slaves, there were native slaves, but they died. <laughs> so we needed to find, we, by we I mean white people, uh, needed to find someone to replace that labor. And so then once that existed, you had to create some kind of complicated, arcane way of being a Christian while also being a, a slave owner. Which, uh, if you read the Bible... Really careful, really closely. It's not pro-slavery, but anyways, it's a de it's easy to miss. It's in a footnote. So, anyways, th this idea of like intercontinental whiteness, I think it's interesting. I I brought this up here too, uh, just because uh, a different Caribbean thinker, uh, M. A. Césaire, um, uh, brought up the idea of negritude, or he was part of the negritude movement. And uh, that's the basic idea that there is sort of an international blackness movement that should exist. That you know that a a um, you know a black person in Augusta, Georgia, probably has a lot in common with a black person in Dakar, Senegal. That or you know that there's some kind of intercontinental link of the black experience, which should be thought of extra-nationally, outside of nationalism. So I wonder if, <laughs> if more mother isn't putting forth, like, the opposite of negritude would be, like, Caucasianitude? <laughs> like, that there's some kind of inter... And it, obviously that exists, right? Because that's how white... I mean, it's not like white supremacy is not a, a system that exists and jumps over the ocean. I mean, white supremacy is one of the most effectively spread ideas in the history of civilization. So... Yeah. And just, you know, it's great because you get to revisit all these lyrics, you know, handshakes, powers and contacts, handshakes, all these, you know, powers and contacts. And where did they get the money? Where did they get the money? And that's the thing, right? Where did they get the money to pay back the slave owners? Where did they get the money? They got the money from extracting the money from the enslaved people. Where did they get the money? <laughs> so you take away their freedom, you kill their family, kill their culture. Then, when you free them, you take the money that they earned and give it to the people who robbed them in the first place. It kind of bursts into this cool kind of cinematic strings, creaking sound to end. Uh, then Liverpool wins, movement three, just this piano. It's so gorgeous. Never underestimate her musicianship here. Out of the dust, the plague, the fire, the wars, the bailout, Liverpool wins. And I like this because I think there's even a little sound of a, of a Liverpool... Um, of a Liverpool uh, soccer match in the back, you know, football match. That sounds like to me. I don't know. But just the piano and violin are just so gorgeous. The sound of bodies, the sound, the sound of bodies being forced overboard, the sound. And she really wants to end it with this haunting, dramatic strings, this horror movie. It's just... It's a horror movie. And it's a history lesson. And it's a beautiful piece of art. And it's all these things at once. So I said I'd end with good news, okay?
71,000 people watched Fantano's video about this. That's cool. He gave a very good, concise explanation of the themes of the album. That means 71,000 people engaged with the, the, the thesis of this album, which, of course, is Williams' thesis about Right. Uh, so w Williams' thesis is this. Slavery is profitable. Slavery was so profitable that it ushered in the Industrial Revolution. When slavery was not profitable, it was ended. Right. That's the thesis. So that thesis, through Moore Mother's great work, has been spread to, at the very least, 71,000 people on Fantano, uh, plus the hundreds of thousands of listens to the actual music itself. And now this video right here is probably going to get, I had to guess, Based on, based on how my videos do, I'm going to guess 1,200 people will watch this video throughout its lifetime. Thank you for being one of those people. Here's your homework. You tell two people, at least two people, hey, did you know that in England, uh, in Britain, there was like this myth that slavery was, was abolished because like, you know, people just thought it was wrong. But it turns out this, this, like, this uh, historian from Trinidad, he figured out that it was actually economically advantageous and that they could actually use it to reinforce their empire and justify their navy and carve up Africa. It was like a good way to fight against the French as well, you know? Isn't that interesting? You do that. That's spreading more good. That is spreading more historical accuracy, okay? So that's how we can do more good things. That's how more good things can happen. So that's your homework. You got to tell two people the basic idea of this album because I didn't know it. And now I know it. And now I've told you. And you tell people, and we, we might have thousands, we might go viral with this thing. What if we went viral over, over cool stuff, important things? You know, more, more happy stuff I'm thinking about. You know, so I mentioned this before, but my grandmother, this nice woman, she was of her time. So, you know, she was a, a little racist, not super racist, a little racist. She was proud of, of, of being from Philadelphia. And her last name was Moore, so I always called her Mother Moore. So it's very funny to have Moore Mother and Mother Moore both being from Philadelphia. <laughs> and my grandmother's grandmother was a Towson, like of this city, Towson, Maryland. I told you, I'm, there's lots of blood, lots of blood, lots of blood in my family tree. And what's interesting is in the town of Towson, they converted a plantation that's now used as a place to teach. That's interesting. My final last piece of good news is I went to a school called Wheaton College. It's a good college, Massachusetts, not the Christian one in Illinois. And uh, when I was a senior there in 1999, uh, this great black American artist came. I don't know his name. I emailed my old professors. They haven't gotten back to me. But he was this very militant artist. And, and he like showed all these images, the famous images of the slave ships and the way that, uh, the, way that the, the Africans were like stocked like cordwood, you know, in the Middle Passage. He did all this amazing, very controversial work with that, and then he mixed it in with lots of like images of like black penises, and um, and like I didn't know what the fuck was going on. I didn't know what the hell he was talking about. <laughs> like, like I was so lost. I grew up in the '80s and '90s, and I had no understanding at all of what he was trying to say about like sexuality and and white fragility and and the slave trade the education system completely failed me and my kids if they got that same lesson they would understand it because we have actually made progress in our education system to diversify our curriculum we have made progress and i want you to be proud of it i want you to be proud of it that you might have been bored by parts of this lesson because it was stuff you already knew i want you to be proud of the progress that we made where the version of history that we have is not exclusively comforting myths. Now keep up the fight. <sighs> Destroy all comforting myths. <laughs> all right, there we go. I don't like it when I get political. It's getting dark in here. Anyways, I, I hang this up in my office, by the way. I think this is a great piece of art, and it's a good reminder, you know? <sighs> Complexity of history. All right. Until next time, uh, there's a camera. Oh, wait. In the comments, tell me, did you tell two people? There's a camera.